Good morning, Elmira. This is the Mark Twain statue in the Gannett Trip Library on the campus of Elmira College. I'm JD Isles, and this is Hidden Landmarks Live. So today we're on the campus of Elmira College because that is where the Mark Twain archive is that is a part of the Center for Mark Twain Studies. And we're actually going to go upstairs and we're going to see what I think is one of the rarest artifacts from Samuel Clemens' life and his time in Elmira. Thank you as always for joining me on Friday morning. I really, really appreciate it. And one interesting thing I want to talk about is, so this statue sits in the library uh, lobby, and there is a tradition of leaving coins in the pockets and Samuel Clemens' pipe um, when students want to do well on a test. And so Pam, so, do people actually do better on tests if they leave coins in the pockets? That would be between you and Mr. Clemens. All right. So I'm going to see what 20 bucks would get me. And we are going to go up. We are going to go up to the archives right now. So, you know, this is a working library. This library is part of Elmira College. So what's the link to Elmira, uh, what's the link to Elmira, New York with Samuel Clemens, Mark Twain, and what is the link to Elmira College specifically? So everyone knows, or everyone should know, that Mark Twain wrote the majority of his important works right here in Elmira during what were 20 some summers. So, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, um, Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court, Prince and the Pauper, they were all written right here. So that's an important tie. Of course, he met his wife, Olivia Langdon. Livy, not for the first time here in Elmira, but he courted her in Elmira. And they were eventually married on February 2nd, 1870. Now, additionally, Elmira College was founded in 1855. This was the college that Livy attended. And one thing that was very, um, one thing that was very important about Elmira College is that it was the first college in the United States to offer a degree of study for women that was equivalent to men's degrees. Now, eventually, Elmira, Elmira College went co-educational in 1969, but when Libby went here, it was an all-girls school. So this is the Mark Twain Archive, which is a part of the Center of Mark Twain Studies. And the Center for Mark Twain Studies is really a driving force in academia. They really sponsor and kind of push scholars to continue to delve into Mark Twain's life. It's not only Mark Twain's writing that scholars find so interesting. Mark Twain is a person that woke up, started writing, started doing letters, started taking notes, and it pretty much continued until he actually went to sleep at night. So there's a tremendous amount of documentation about him, mostly done by him, that gives scholars a lot of fodder to look at. So if there's some aspect of Mark Twain's life that you've wondered about, Samuel Clemens' life you've ever wondered about, um, chances are there's some academic paper that was written on it. So we so this is the archives, and we are here to s today to see Nathaniel Ball. I got that right, right. correct? You're correct. All right, terrific. So, so what is your role here at the archives and the Center for Mark Twain Studies? So, uh, multiple roles. So I do 
I take care of the Elmira College archives, the Mark Twain archive. I take care of the, the art collection here. Yep. So the role, my role, has increased at Quarry Farm to take care of the collections there, which used to be just un housed under the center. And now we, we work together to take care of um, right. the objects up at the farm. Yeah, and the collection up at the farm is primarily things that have been written about Twain. It's contemporary work, correct? No, so really what's at Quarry Farm are items that have remained at Quarry Farm. So when we got uh, Quarry Farm in 1982, um, it came with everything inside it. Um, originally, the Langdon family were going to keep those things. Um, later, they decided to just leave it with the college. Um, and so really what we have there is the Langdon Library. We have the Crane Library. Uh, we have some Ida Langdon, who is uh, Mark Twain's niece and professor at the college. Um, some of her books are up there as, as well. Uh, we have um, paintings, artwork that was in the house since Susan Crane's time. Yeah. Um, we have a lot of the original furniture as well. So, the, the, is, it, is it right? The majority of the legacy books are on the first floor, then on the second yeah. floor is like a reference library. Yeah, so we really tried to increase um, the availability of fellows staying here to just be able to work up at the farm. Um, and so we've really tried to get a better handle on what's up there to keep that updated so they have a good reference collection while they're there to actually work. Right. Now, we're gonna take a look at something in just a second, but the first thing I wanna do is I really wanna remark on this room. Um, so, first of all, this room is stunning. Uh, this is a fantastic office that you have. Sure. <laughs> we're gonna see Nathaniel's office in just a second. But this is a tremendous room, and one thing that I want to point out is this bas-relief carving that's above the fireplace here is actually from Clockroth's Tavern, or Clockroth's Saloon, which was one of Samuel Clemens' favorite haunts when he was in Elmira. And the ceiling tiles, too? Yeah, so the lattice ceiling actually came from that building as well. The whole lattice ceiling? Wow. Yeah. Okay. All right. Terrific. And the look would have been very similar. Yeah, so originally this was intended to be, when this building was, was, was built and opened, we just celebrated our 50th anniversary, um, they had just decided to start an archives here. And so we got the study in 52. Uh, J. Ralph Murray, who was the pred came around 54, uh, was really into collecting. And so the art collection here really started at that time. But since we got the study in 52, he became very active in trying to collect first editions and things like that. So that's really when the Mark Twain collection here began right. uh, it's with J. Ralph Murray. And so a lot of what's in the cases in this room are those first editions and rare editions that we have of Mark Twain and some other people as well. Yeah. So, so now the actual, the business end of the archive okay. is here. Yeah. And so reference collection here and archives here. Yeah. So really, this is this is where it all happens. Um, where do you have tucked away the thing we came specifically to see today? Right up here. So what we're going to see, and, and I'm going to ask Nathaniel about this, I, I think this is by far one of the rarest artifacts um, from Samuel Clemens' life. And let's go to the table. Let's go out and let's take a look at this. So exciting. There's a door. All right, so what we've got in this box is we've got what are known as the contract stones. And it's a series of three pieces of the same stone. It looks to be a river stone, although it might not be. We're near the river, so it could be. Um, and it dates, the writing on it dates from July 2nd, 1895. Um, so roughly the writing on these is about 125 years old. And here is why I think these are so interesting. And folks at home, I doubt very much you're going to be able to read sure. much of this, if anything. Um, 
But the reason these are so interesting is among Samuel Clemens friends, close friends in Elmira, uh, were the Beechers, Mr. and Mrs. Thomas K. Beecher. Um, and of course, Reverend Beecher was from the Park Church in Elmira, which was directly across the street from the Langdon home. And um, his wife, Julia, his second wife, um, was a very positive person. And Samuel Clemens would walk past their home um, all the time going from the Langdons up to Quarry Farm because he walked a lot. Yep. It's kind of a long walk. I think it's a long drive, <laughs> but okay, sure, let's walk it. Um, so he would stop and he would see Julia on occasion. And one time they were having a debate and apparently she was a very positive person. He's a little less positive, generally. Sure. And they were having an argument about everlasting life. So, so how did that argument go, roughly? Well, I think, you know, Julia's idea is that um, there is an afterlife. And, of course, Mark, Mark Twain, being a little more cynical, uh, uh, doubted that very much. Um, what I find particularly interesting, what I find interesting about these stones is that um, something I was just actually noticing the other day, which is that as part of this contract, so yes, these, these go together, um, but this last stone um, is, is on. Oh, right here, yeah, there we go. So he actually signs this Mark Twain, which I find very interesting that he chooses to use his pen name with close friends. Right. Um, so I don't actually know the impetus behind that, that, that um, the, the use of Mark Twain here, um, rather than uh, Sam Clemens, as we oftentimes refer to him here in Elmira, because that's when he got to be himself, right. um, and he wasn't um, under any other eye. You know, he, he had a, a chance to write and just and just be here and be himself. Yeah. So basically, what these contract stones say, the gist of it, um, it really came from. Uh, Julia Beecher saying, now Mr. Clements, if you meet me in heaven a million years from now, will you confess that you were wrong? Meaning that there is an afterlife, which of course Sam was, you know, not quite so sure about, to put it mildly. Um, so this was basically a contract, and the guess is that these are in Samuel Clemens' own hand. Yeah, oh yeah. And he came up with the idea that he was going to present her with these stones, Basically saying, if you're right and I'm wrong, I'll eat crow. It's basically what it was, um, what he said. And so, for for as an example, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but the first b verse here is, if you prove right and I prove wrong, a million years from now, in language plain and frank and strong, my error I'll avow to your dear mocking face. So, and it goes on and on, but. You know, the thing I think it, that is fantastic about these is here we have something written in Mark Twain's own hand uh, on stones that would have been probably from sure. Quarry Farm and um, also interacted with the Beechers, which in, as far as um, abolitionist scholarship, they are huge. They are superstars. Sure. Um, all right, so we're going to look at a couple other things. Sure. Um, could we look at the um, the Holy Land book? Yeah, of course. So, so one of the one of the interesting debates that academics have is how important Elmira, New York, was to Mark Twain's writing and Mark the formation of Mark uh, Twain's Samuel Clemens. Um, thinking and it seems like the more we learn the more we realize Elmira was essential to crafting who you know the persona of Mark Twain right. and what Samuel Clemens chose to write about sure so what I find very interesting about this book in general so this is um, William Prime's um, Tent Life in the Holy Land um, we received this from Irene Landon in the late 2000s, um, and it sort of gives us another look into um, Sam Cummins' thinking. Um, 
Mark Woodhouse, my predecessor here, actually did an article on this, and I just came across this recently. Um, there was a, a short um, manuscript written by Harriet Lewis Path. So this was uh, Livy's uh, cousin, and in it she claims that um, that that summer of courtship '69 that Mark Twain at that time was going up and down the hill to write at Quarry Farm, uh, and that he would come back to the house and, and read what he had written um, that day. Uh, so up to now, we really haven't talked about uh, Innocence Abroad as being his most well-received, most uh, 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 most purchased book at the time in his lifetime. Um, we've never made that kind of association with uh, Elmira, and I think that between this manuscript and Mark Woodhouse points out in his article that um, this book itself also, um, that he writes in extensively, um, also certain passages that he highlights um, are directly mentioned in Innocence Abroad. So he makes this comparison that it certainly had to um, have been here that Mark Twain had put this in Innocence Abroad. Um, and we also know through another letter from, to his uh, publisher at the time that he still had around 200,000 words left to write of the, of the manuscript. So it left a lot of room for work to actually be done when he was in Elmira. So this is the, the, the spring and summer that would be the, the, uh, when Jervis Langdon passes. Um, so that's, let's take a look. So this is actually uh, Char Charlie Langdon's copy that Mark Twain writes in. So this is, um, has uh, Charlie's signature in it um, and says at the bottom, left Elmira 4.38 p.m. June 5th, 1867. And of course, Charlie Langdon was on the Clipper City tour um, where he would eventually show Mark Twain the picture of his sister uh, yeah. and history would be written from them. Yeah. So, so a couple things are happening with this piece. Um, you know, one is that all of Mark Twain's significant writing, and now it seems like we're adding another one to that list, all of Mark Twain's significant writing and editing really happened here. He confessed himself that he really couldn't get a lot of, a lot of things done sure. in Hartford because it was a little too social. It was, sure. There were always people in and out of the house. This is where he came to write in peace and quiet. But the other thing we're getting into is we're getting into the marginalia. So roughly 1983, Elmira College gets Quarry Farm as a gift from the Langdons. And you go up there and you say, okay, what do we got? We got furniture, we got pots, pans, we got a whole lot of books. Do you know roughly when was the moment when the Center for Mark Twain Studies realized that inside of almost all of these books, there was writing in the margins by Mark Twain, so my, by Samuel Clemens. Sure. So, so my understanding of this goes back and forth a little bit because uh, I, I understand that um, Jervis Langdon gave um, a series of Dickens to the college before we received Quarry Farm. So that seems to tell me that they knew that there were books in there. The story sort of goes that no one really knew, uh, and those books had been on the shelves since Mark Twain's time, and so therefore, as people went through them, they started to find, it, find uh, margin, marginal notes by Mark Twain. Um, so we don't know. It was roughly 85, so it was a couple of years later before um, they started to be discovered in the books, and then it be became sort of a thing for scholars to do as they stayed yeah. at Quarry Farm to sort of, yeah, see if yeah. they could find another book. And it's a whole area of study now. Sure. Yeah. So I brought with me one great example, I think. Uh, this is from a uh, translation from Greek by John Dryden. This is a book that's probably up on the shelves in, at Quarry Farm right now. And, you know, Sam pokes fun at just about everybody. Um, here he's saying, so translated um, from the Greek uh, into rotten English is what uh, Sam Clemens adds. And also he adds, uh, the whole carefully revised and corrected by an ass. So, you know, this is the tone of a lot of these... Um, you know, these are basically Facebook comments. 
it sure. is is, sure. is basically what's happening here. Um, all right, and so there are some scholars that have devoted almost everything to marginalia. Sure, yeah, taking a look at, I think what we really see here is Mark Twain's just gut reaction to what he's reading, and so oftentimes they are pretty critical. Um, and most of the time, pretty comical as well. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we're going to take a look at one more thing. Can we take a look at the negatives? Sure. So a lot, you know, it's funny. When I go to the Shimon County Historical Society, you know, I always ask everybody, you know, I ask the curator, um, I ask the director, so anything new? And they always look at me and they always laugh and they're like, there's nothing new in history. There's always something new in history. So, I'm going to let Nathaniel tell this story because it's a great story and I don't want to steal any of his thunder. <laughs> so, the story goes. So, um, we, we had a, a scholar staying at the farm sometime in the 80s or early 90s um, who, of course, as the marginalia started to present itself, um, uh, scholars got a little more... Um, savvy in their research so we had a scholar actually go up into the attic and scrounge around up there and he had found a, a, a box of negatives um, and brought them down to the archive um, at first I think for until I came here we thought that these corresponded to a set of positive prints that we already had in the archives it was from uh, Charlie Langan's uh, European trip and so a lot of these photographs uh, roughly 200 of them are from that that trip, so not, not too uh, important to us. But the other few hundred are actually shot in Elmira uh, around the time that, that, that uh, Twain was summering here. Um, and we have photos from 1888 and 1889. Um, and it was with the first Kodak camera that allowed you know, people to, to kind of point and, and, and shoot. And so we get these photos from um, the Langdon family themselves. Although no, no photo in, in this collection um, we can identify Mark Twain, we, we do identify his, some of his daughters. Um, and uh, it just paints a real nice portrait of what Elmira looked at the time and looked like at the time. And so what we see here in these negatives are um, a lot of them are uh, taken in and around. Langdon Mansion. So we, mm -hmm. we get looks at Park Church, the Trinity Church, um, and we get looks at just what daily life was actually like. Uh, and I think that that really helps um, us understand a little bit more of, of Mark Twain's Elmira. Yeah. And, and so, and really, really the message here is that, um, you know, there is still new things being discovered. Sure. That is always happening. And, um, you know, the Center for Mark Twain Studies, the archives, is always looking for somebody has something in their attic that could shed more light either on the Langdon family or the Clemens family here in Elmira. And if you've got something like that, certainly they would <laughs> definitely like to see it. Well, listen, I want to thank you very much. You did. I want to thank all of you for joining us on a Friday morning. Uh, this is Hidden Landmarks Live, and I will see you again next week.